After uh, sitting and hearing the uh, scripture read, I realize how different it sounds to be hearing so much of the Old Testament on Christmas Sunday. But I also know the end of the sermon, so <laughs> I'm not too worried, and I hope you'll uh, follow me there. My name is, is, my name is Pastor Nick. I am the youth pastor here at Grace Church of Harmony, and it is always a tremendous compliment for Pastor Pete to uh, trust me with the pulpit. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and as I jokingly tell the kids, every moment in my life has led to this because that's what every moment is. About 20 years ago, there was a movie that came out, and it involved a hired killer who worked for a gangster as, as muscle, and he would quote the Bible before he shot the victim. And one of the interesting parts of the movie is when he starts to think about his life and the passage of Scripture that he quotes. I've edited it, obviously, for the pulpit. The Bible passage isn't very accurate, but to be honest, I first saw it when I was 13, and I was just excited to hear that the Bible was being quoted, and then I became a Christian later. But you will see how this fits in. So the setting is that the hired killer is in a diner that is being robbed, and he pulls his gun on the would-be robber, and this is what he says to the robber. There's a passage I got memorized, Ezekiel 25, 17. The path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the iniquities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Blessed is he who in the name of charity and goodwill shepherds the weak through the valley of darkness. For he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers. And you will know I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon you. I've been saying that stuff for years. And if you ever heard it, it meant you were dead. I never really questioned what it meant. I thought it was just a cold-blooded thing to say to someone before you shot him. But I saw some things this morning that made me think twice. Now I'm thinking, it could mean that you're the evil man, and I'm the righteous man. And Mr. 45 here, he's the shepherd, protecting my righteous behind in the valley of darkness. Or it could be that you're the righteous man, and I'm the shepherd, and it's this world that's evil and selfish. I'd like that. But that ain't the truth. The truth is that you're weak, and I'm the tyranny of evil men, but I'm trying. I'm trying real hard to be a shepherd. What really intrigued me about this, and the reason this kept popping back into my mind as I was writing my sermon, as weird as that sounds, is that I know that there are times when we hear passages of Scripture, there's times when I hear passages of Scripture over and over and never really think about them beyond the basic meaning until something happens. And then it allows me to see it in a new light. And I realize that I'm especially guilty of that when the time for the benediction comes around during the church service. Even if the Steelers aren't playing, it's easy to check out as soon as Pastor Pete says, please stand for the benediction, because all I'm thinking about is I need to get to that back door <laughs> to greet people. But there is so much truth in the words of the different benedictions, and especially the passage that we're looking at today in, from number six. The passage isn't just a warm cliche to make us feel good when we leave, and it's not a toast. I'm sure you've all heard the toast, may those that love us love us, and those that don't love us, may God turn their hearts and if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles, so we'll know them by their limping. That's a toast that sort of expresses our feelings. It comes from how we feel. But number six is a high priestly blessing ordained by God to be pronounced whenever the nation of Israel gathered together for collective worship and sacrifice, as well as when an individual Israelite brought sacrifices to the Lord. The nature of this blessing is like that of an oracle, a sure word from God that he'd accepted the sacrifice and was pleased with the worshiper. These words are God expressing his feelings for his people and what he's making his people into. And even, and even though it can come across as being repetitive and simple in this passage, there is a ton of theology behind it. It's a promise that shows what God has in store for all of his people. It shows that God wants to invest greatly in his people and that he's committed and that his people will share his name. And because his people share his name, they will also share his characteristics. Uh, I, I went to go see the new Star Wars movie with my college roommate last week, and we were talking about all sorts of things, and one of the things that came up was how much our kids are like us. I was telling him I look at Rory sometimes at home, and, and her attitude and the things she does, it reminds me of watching a little version of me, which is hilarious to me and very frustrating to Amanda. And he was telling me that his five-year-old daughter acts just like him a lot of the ways, in a lot of ways. And the interesting thing is that neither of our children are biologically related to us. And so it was all because of the relationship that we had with them. The part, they were part of our family, and so they began acting like us. And this is true as God's children, too. I mean, 
I know that we also share blood with Christ. Uh, but as his children, we share his family name. We are marked as Christians. We are marked as being members of his family. And so we'll notice the characteristics of God as, as he works within us. We've been made righteous and holy. We will show love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all because we have a relationship with him. And becoming like him and the promises that he makes is what this blessing, the ironic er blessing, is about. There are six specific blessings and, and promises that God makes if his conditions are met. So we'll, we'll talk about the blessings first, and then we'll get to the conditions. First, God promises to bless his people. This is the promise of the sum of all of the covenant blessings that God has shown his people and extends to them because they are marked as his people. If you recall back in the Old Testament, especially in Genesis, Pastor Pete had been preaching through there uh, for a while this past year, uh, if you recall the, the blessings that fathers in the book of Genesis gave to their sons, it's the same situation. It began with God giving his blessing to Adam, who was referred to in the book of Luke as the son of God. And sure, Adam failed in the curse, and then there was the fall, but God promised his blessing again through Abraham, and again and again through his descendants, despite the fact that they kept messing up. Or maybe because of that fact is why he kept proclaiming it over and over again. And as the passage in Leviticus uh, that Pastor Bob read, this blessing entails fruitfulness, descendants, flocks, harvests, but these are merely a token of what the true blessing is and the fact that they have a relationship, a close relationship, with the one true living God of all creation. Only if God is our Father can anyone truly be blessed. Second, God promises to keep his people. Not only a promise to enrich them by God's grace being extended to them, but also a promise to exercise great care over his people. A promise of divine protection for his people. Psalm 121 is a well-known psalm. As soon as I start reading part of it, you'll remember the songs that we sing there based on it. And it does a great job of illustrating what it means for God to keep his people. Here's what Psalm 121 says. I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The, Lord shall, the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth forever and ever. The psalmist describes the Lord as keeping his people in a ton of different ways. Safety when traveling, protection from evil, protection of their very life, watching you when you are coming, when you are going, forever, and he will never sleep as he does so. Ever vigilant. God truly is the shepherd of his people. Third, God promises to make his face shine upon his people. That Yahweh's face shines upon his people is a promise that God's presence will always be with them. And even more, that he enjoys being with his people. It's not that he's sort of committed and sort of rolls his eyes. He loves being with his people. He loves being in their presence. He loves saving, protecting, healing, providing for his children. The picture of the idiom here that, it, that the idiom paints is the image of a beaming parent the beaming face of a parent as he or she watches his or her beloved. It shows that God watches over us like a doting parent. When we first brought our daughter Aurora home, she was three days old. I remember telling someone that if it were possible for me to quit my job and just watch her for the rest of my life, I would very seriously consider doing so. Uh, because I just loved holding her. I loved watching her. I loved kissing her, just knowing that she was part of our family. And a few weeks later, during one of the services, I had to come up to read scripture, and uh, before I left the pew, I gave Rory a kiss on the head, because, you know, we just couldn't get enough of Rory. And uh, after the service, someone came up to me and told me that uh, they had told the person next to them during the service to watch, because they knew that I was going to get up and kiss Rory before I left. And so I guess it was pretty obvious at that point that I was completely enamored with our daughter. But what really sort of is almost incomprehensible is the fact that God feels even more strongly about you, and he feels even more strongly about me. In the same way that we love the people in our life who are our people, who we consider family, God loves us, and infinitely more than that. Whether we are getting up or lying down, whether we're coming or going, God is watching, pleased with us because he loves us, 
And through his grace and blessings, he is, if you will, kissing us on the head any time that we're doing anything. So we have three promises from God so far. That he will bless you, that he will keep you, that he will make his face shine upon you. And the fourth is to be gracious to you. This is God's promise to manifest his favor and his grace in the events of our life. Since he cares for his people, since he has invested in them, of course he wants to be there day to day. And even though we don't always think of the Old Testament hammering this a lot, it reinforces the fact that God's favor is not earned in any way. Instead, God shows mercy simply because of his love and simply because of his faithfulness and because he made an oath to his people. And that's something that God shows to his people over and over and over again throughout Scripture. God shows himself to be long-suffering with his people, whether an individual or on a national level, no matter how many times his people mess up, God is always there. So blessing number five, God promises to lift up his countenance upon his people. This promise, or as it's sometimes translated, that God will lift his face to you, is a promise to pay attention to his people. To do anything besides lifting his face to you is not good. I'm not going overboard when I say that it is, in fact, bad. Facial imagery like this is used throughout the Old Testament to describe relationships with God. In Genesis 4, God was not pleased with the sacrifice of Cain, and so when God sees Cain, he asks them, why has your face fallen? Which means, Cain, why are you so angry with me? You won't even look at me. And in the Psalms, for God to turn his face away from his people meant that God was withholding his support, his blessing, his favor, and his peace with that person. The psalmist often comment that if God turns his face away, they would surely suffer and die because only God has the word of life. So for God to lift his face to you means that he is pleased with you. He isn't angry. He's not withholding anything from you. And it means that he will give you the sixth promise that is here, which is peace. Lloyd Corey is credited with saying, peace is the brief, glorious moment in history when everybody stands around reloading. The peace God extends isn't exactly this kind of peace. It's not just an absence of strife. Uh, It's not an absence of strife or conflict, conflict, but the loaded Jewish concept of shalom. God would give his people a state of wholeness, a state of well-being, a state of completeness, which refers to every aspect of their life. Shalom is the sum of all of God's blessings, and it means enjoying everything that comes from a relationship with God and enjoying those things in perfect fullness. And this completeness and this fullness can only come by entering a state of wholeness and unity with God through a restored relationship. It means calmness, health, rest, the result of God's activity in the covenants that he makes and is the result of righteousness. There is a reason that Jesus is called the Prince of Peace in the Bible or the Prince of Shalom. It's because he brings completion, wholeness, and restoration by uniting believers with the Father through his cross and his blood. So as a quick summary uh, of this passage, God promises these things to the people of Israel. Fruitfulness or a blessing from a relationship with him, protection of the divine shepherd, God's presence and him taking pleasure in his people, God's unmerited grace, that's four, that he will always be paying attention to his people, and shalom, a restored relationship with him and the wholeness and completeness that comes with it. All of this shows just how much God wants to invest in his people. He explicitly states that as much in verse 27. When he says that he wants Israel to be marked with his very name, he's saying he wants them to be his people without a doubt. And there is so much promise in this blessing that it's almost hard to get a grasp of what what everything is at one time. It's like when you were little and you would say a word over and over and over again until it became absolutely meaningless. I, not that I ever did that as a kid, but truthfully, I probably always did. And this blessing comes at the end of an extended passage that details the responsibilities of the Levitical priests and the people of Israel. Because of where this blessing is, it is essentially God saying, if you, Israel, promise to do these things, if you keep these laws for sacrifices, the ceremonial laws, and the priests keep their laws as detailed in Leviticus 1 through number 6, then this is the fullness of God's blessing that they will enjoy. Remember, all of these instructions came to Moses at Mount Sinai. When he comes back down to the mountain, he tells his people, God's people, what God expects of them and how God is going to prepare them for the promised land. And this means that because he is holy, his people will, must be holy, and he will make them holy as well. So if they do these things, then God is pleased and all of the promises will be true. So taking all of this into consideration, 
taking the fact that we are not Jewish in this church, taking that we don't offer sacrifices, why is it included in a list of the benedictions that are edifying for the church? If you happen to look at a list of benedictions, and you know, all sorts of books have them, this is the only Old Testament benediction that, uh, that the church uses. So why do we use it? There are so many promises in the Old Testament that don't directly apply to us as Christians because they were made to, hit, made to the nation of Israel. Why is this one okay? Well, one reason uh, is that a bunch of people have likened this blessing to the Lord's Prayer in that it provides the model of how God wants his people, the spiritual leaders of his people, to bless them. And this is demonstrated when the psalmist cries out over and over in their psalms that they were crying out for the promises that God promised them here. Oftentimes you'll hear them cry, Yahweh, keep me. Don't turn your face away from me. Give me protection. Give me peace. Look upon me with love and favor because if you turn your face away, I'm not going to make it. Another reason is if you were to look at these blessings and condense these promises into two words, they would be grace, God's unmerited favor, and the many blessings that he extends to his people, and peace, restoration, and a loving relationship with God and everything that comes with it. And this blessing is called to mind by Paul at the beginning of every one of his letters. If you read every one of the letters that he ever wrote, he always includes some variation of grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But perhaps the biggest reason of all is if we place our faith in Christ, if we trust in the works of Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, then we are in the one who in his own words says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. If we are in Christ, then the requirements of the law are fulfilled perfectly. Then the oracle that God promised in this blessing is true for us too. And this is reinforced throughout the New Testament. So, does the Lord bless those in Jesus Christ? Ephesians 1 says this. I'm not going to read all of Ephesians, just so you know. Ephesians 1 says this. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for the adoption as sons, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. And in Jesus we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which was set forth in Christ. God definitely promises that he will bless us through Jesus Christ. Does the Lord promise to keep those who trust in his Son? Well, in John 10, it says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And in Hebrews chapter 13, the author writes, Keep your life free from love or money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? God promises that he is our keeper, that he is our shepherd, and he is watching out for us because of Jesus. Does God's face shine upon us? Well, you may recall the parable of the uh, the prodigal son. Jesus teaches, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said, said to him, Father, I have sinned against you and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. His presence is always with us, and it seems that he is certainly more than pleased to be able to celebrate being with us. What about being gracious to us? In the Gospel of John, John writes, From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace, or grace and grace again, and more grace. We not not only receive just grace, but we receive a ridiculous amount of grace from God, grace that is overflowing into our lives. Does God lift up his countenance upon us? Does he lovingly pay attention to us? Well, Romans 8 says, and we know that for those who love God and are called according to We know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And in 1 John 
John writes, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and that if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have, requests that we have asked from him. God listens to our prayers. He watches everything that we're doing, paying attention all the time, so that everything, without exception, is working for the best according to what is God's will. And finally, do we have peace? Well, in Romans 5, Paul writes this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance and endures character and character hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And we will have the ultimate shalom in the new heaven and the new earth. In Revelation 21, it's written, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha, I am the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. It certainly seems it to be a beautiful way to describe the completeness and the wholeness that we will find in God at the end of time. That we will enjoy from a restored relationship that we enjoy as believers in Christ. Coming up this week is New Year's Eve, which is always excellent. It means that the Sylvester 5K it will be happening. It means they will be walking around with all those pretzels on sticks, which is always one of my favorite parts. And uh, we'll be dropping the ball according to German time and counting down in German, uh, which is good, but I don't know how to say it. Uh, and it often means New Year's resolutions, right? New Year's resolutions come up. And there is something that is refreshing and, and freeing about a new year. There's something nice, uh, even if the only change is that we write a six instead of a five at the end, there's something nice that feels like it's an opportunity to sort of start fresh, to, to begin new habits. It reminds me a lot of uh, the new semester. Uh, one of the things I noticed in youth group is when we have prayer requests, at the beginning of the semester, you know, everyone's praying for friends and things like that. And as we by the time the first like midterm hits or the first test, a couple people start asking for prayer for grades and for schoolwork. And then by the time we get to the end of the semester, I think, partly because no one pays attention sometimes, but everyone will say prayer for grades for school, for grades for tests. And suddenly that is the focus of what everyone is doing. And then the next semester will come and no one will be praying for school again at the beginning of the next semester. Because there's, there's this lightness to, to being able to start fresh uh, in school. To, to know that you can shed the old, the mistakes, uh, the things that make us cringe, or the things that keep us awake at night. Uh, just, just the things we would rather not remember. And if you trust in Christ, then you have the ultimate fresh start. Paul writes that we are new creations in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. God takes our sin and replaces it with Jesus' righteousness and Jesus' obedience. Uh, we have forgiveness, and God views us as his holy children. We have the promise of a relationship with God and all the blessings that come with it. We have the promise that God loves us without conditions, that he will bless us, that he will keep us, that he will smile upon us and give us grace upon grace. He will never turn away from us, and he will make us complete in him. Uh, earlier for the assurance of salvation, I used a portion of of a book called A Gospel Primer for Christians. Milton Vincent wrote it. What he did was when he was struggling with his faith, he, he just poured over scripture uh, for years and was trying to figure out, you know, what he believed and what God meant and all of those things. And as he went through, he realized that uh, all of the promises, all of the assurance and the love and the grace that God poured out uh, to his people if they just have faith in Jesus Christ. And so he wrote this very short book, considerably, and every sentence in it has footnotes 
that show where he got that from, what, what passage of scripture he's sort of condensing or, or, or putting together. And so uh, I, I wanted to read this because I think this is, this is a good way uh, to, to get to the end because it's a reminder of all that God has done for us, the grace that he has, uh, and what it means to have faith in Christ and what it means to be saved. Here's what he writes. He writes, God's grace abounds to me even through trials. Because I am a justified one, he subjugates every trial and forces it to do good unto me. When I sin, God's grace abounds to me all the more as he graciously maintains my justified status as described above. When I sin, God feels no wrath in his heart against me. His heart is filled with nothing but love for me, and he longs for me to repent and confess my sins to him so that he might show me the gracious and forgiving love that he, that he has had in his heart all along. God does not require my confession before he desires to forgive me. In his heart, he has already forgiven me, and when I come to him to confess my sins to him, he runs to me, as it were, and is repeatedly embracing and kissing me even before I get the words of my confession out of my mouth. God does see my sins, and he is grieved by my sins. His grief comes partly from the fact that in my moments of sin, I am not receiving the fullness of his love for me. He even sends chastisement into my life, but he does so because he is for me and he loves me, and he disciplines me for my ultimate good. I don't deserve any of this even on my best day, and this is the truth in which I stand. All of these things are not just good words, they are biblical truths that are the very truth of God that defines us in Christ and what is making us who we are. Jesus was born in a manger, obeyed God until his death, his burial, and resurrection, and all of this is ours. Where there was once guilt, we have forgiveness. Where there was despair, we have hope. Where there was failure, we now have perfection. Where there was death, death we now have eternal life. And where there was condemnation, God has elevated us to, to the position of his sons and his daughters. God only asks, asks that we accept the gift of his grace by placing our faith in his son, and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending your Son to reach down to us and save us. Jesus didn't cling to all the glory and the honor that he deserved, but he lovingly and happily came down, became lowly, and died a horrible death just so that he could draw us near to you. Our hope and trust in Jesus and his resurrection, that, that's all that we have, Father. That, that is where our hope and our trust is. Christmas morning, as a little child, is exciting and wonderful, but it is nothing compared to the joy that we will have in your presence for eternity. We put all of our trust and our faith in you, knowing that only you have the words of eternal life.